Good morning everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to the parallel session of the virtual forum on fossil fuel supply and climate policy. I'm going to just do some brief uh, comments about the conference just to allow some time for people who are joining from the plenary session to join in and then we'll kick things off. Um, for those of you who are just joining this session and didn't join in the other se session, uh, you may or may not be aware that this forum is happening in lieu of a conference that was supposed to be happening in Oxford over the next two days on fossil fuel supply and climate policy. This is the third of these conferences. Um, the, the gap, so to speak, that this conference fills is it provides an opportunity to people to talk about fossil fuel production. So coal, oil and gas production in the context of climate change, something that's often missing from climate change uh, conferences more broadly. Uh, it, very shortly, we'll be plugging in a conference website link for those of you who might want to join us for the next one of these conferences. We're hoping, fingers crossed, that if travel conditions resolve and if health conditions resolve, that we will be able to uh, host the conference again next September in Oxford. And we'll also be hosting a remote event for those of you who want to join us and don't want to get on a plane to go to Oxford to attend. And with that, I might hand it over now to Catherine Harrison, who will be our moderator for this event. Catherine is based at the University of British Columbia, where she's a professor of political science. And I'll let her introduce the panel and the speakers today. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. I'm sorry that we're not together in person, but delighted to be chairing this, um, this panel. Um, the topic of the panel is prospects for international cooperation to manage a transition away from fossil fuel production. Um, the challenge is that the halting progress that we've made to date to coordinate, um, internationally coordinate efforts to constrain fossil fuel consumption will only be undermined if countries just keep producing fossil fuels and flooding global markets in desperation, thus depressing prices and encouraging fossil fuel consumption. So among the questions that I'm hoping panelists in this session will address are, how can we transition away from fossil fuel production at a global scale? What sort of governance arrangements and transition supports will be needed to facilitate international cooperation on a managed decline in fossil fuel supplies? And what are the most promising options for international cooperation? Um, is it through the UNFCCC, perhaps a new fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, or clubs of major fossil fuel producers? Uh, the panelists uh, will draw on their experience in past climate and energy negotiations to highlight some of the challenges to reaching international agreement, but also highlighting examples that already exist of international cooperation on fossil fuel supply. So I will introduce all of the panelists and then we'll get going with a conversation among them. Um, Dr. Ger Ashem is a professor of economics at the University of Oslo in Norway. Dr. Ashem is a prominent scholar of environmental economics and has been recognized as fellow of the European Association of Environmental and Resource Economists and an elected member of the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and Letters. Dr. Haro van Asselt is a professor of climate law and policy at the University of Eastern Finland Law School, an affiliated researcher of the Stockholm Environment Institute, and a visiting research fellow with Utrecht University's Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development. With more than 15 years of research experience, he's an expert on interactions between international climate change governance and other fields of international governance. Sapora Berman is the International Program Director at Stan.Earth and an adjunct professor in York University's Faculty of Environmental Studies. She is previously the co-director of Greenpeace's, Greenpeace International's Global Climate and Energy Program and was the co-founder of Forest Ethics. Among her many accolades for her work as an environmental campaigner, she is currently the recipient of the Climate Breakthrough Award for her work developing a global fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. And finally, Dr. Navroz Dubash is a professor at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. 
Dr. Dubash has been active in the climate policy arena for more than 25 years. He helped establish the Global Climate Action Network in 1990 and is currently a coordinating lead author for the IPCC's sixth assessment report. He advises the UNEP Emissions Gap Report Steering Committee and has been a member of the Scientific Advisory Group of the UN Climate Action Summit. So we've got a fantastic panel of folks to address these questions. Um, to get things started, uh, Dr. Asham, uh, recently you published an article in Science Magazine making the case for a supply-side climate treaty. Um, why do we need international cooperation on fossil fuel production? Thank you very much. Um, yes, together with uh, eight uh, Norwegian co-authors, we, we published last year uh, a policy forum article in science, where we um, argue that the Paris Agreement can be strengthened if fossil fuel producing countries agree on a plan or a treaty for leaving oil, gas and coal deposits permanently in the ground. And what I, do, what I will do make, uh, in my introductory rem remarks, I will uh, present the four key economic mechanisms that we present in support of such uh, uh, supply side policies. First of all, they will enhance the impact of the Paris Agreement in the presence of free riders. Um, the problem is that uh, uh, demand side policies like the Paris Agreement, if it works, are undermined by the so-called so -called uh, so carbon leakage. Um, demand side policies cause lower fossil fuel prices, which in turn lead to increase use of fossil fuels in free riding countries. Uh, producer countries can counter this by reducing their supply of fossil fuels, and thereby contributing to higher global fossil fuel prices. And it can be shown that the cost efficient mix of supply side and demand side policies for the group of producer countries depends on how supply and demand for fossil fuels among free riders depend, uh, respond to changes in fossil fuel prices. But it's not the case that uh, one wants to depend only on demand side policies. The second argument is that uh, uh, such supply side policies will enhance uh, investments in green technology. The producer treaty will raise the expected future prices of fossil fuels, also in countries without their own climate policies. And this makes it more profitable for private investors to invest in climate friendly technologies. The third key um, argument is that uh, such supply side policies will ensure against a failed Paris Agreement. And if, if the Paris Agreement succeeds, then the producer treaty is um, superfluous and inexpensive. And it might even be that uh, it might avoid waste by pre preventing development of deposits and investments in development of a, a Deposits and investments in infrastructure that will end up being unprofitable, uh, but which are planned by investors with weak belief in, in uh, effective future climate policies. As uh, last year's production gap report uh, demonstrates, this is a real possibility as planned future fossil fuel developments far exceed a, le a level consistent with uh, climate goals. So that's if the Paris Agreement succeeds. However, if the Paris Agreement fails, then a producer treaty will temper this serious effects of continued ineffective demand side cl climate policies and thus be essential in, in this case. And the fourth and final argument is that uh, such supply side policies will bring producers on the team. And that's important because fossil fuel producers have often blocked climate action. Um, so if uh, supply side policies will, will benefit producers as, uh, as a group um, um, because, um, so why is that? Because uh, for, even though producers would lose on deposits that will remain untouched, something that will happen also with a successful Paris Agreement, they will gain on fossil fuels that are nonetheless produced since fossil fuel produced fossil fuel prices will, will be higher. So that's the argument for why it's, uh, it will be a, a, a good thing for fossil fuel producers and, and bring them on the, on, the, on the team and not uh, having them blocking climate action. In our science article, we also mentioned possible uh, uh, practical steps uh, towards supply side, uh, uh, supply side 
by my treaty, but for now I will leave this uh, for others and perhaps return to that later in the, in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I would add if uh, participants check out the chat function, there is a link to uh, the the science article, the case for a supply side climate treaty there, and also um, a link to the International Conference on Fossil Fuel Supply and Climate Policy next year's uh, conference, we hope. Um, okay, turning to Haro Van Asselt, uh, what options do we have for addressing fossil fuel production at the international level? And what key issues should be considered when developing some form of international governance, governance on fossil fuel supply and climate change? Over to you. All right, thank you, Catherine, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, so we already have heard from Professor Islam, uh, who has laid out the case for international cooperation of fossil fuel production. And I would say his argument resonates in various academic and civil society proposals that we have seen so far, such as the proposal that I'm sure that uh, my fellow panelists will be talking about for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Beyond such proposals, already, uh, we should also uh, know that international cooperation is already taking place in related areas. So we know, for example, that a small group of countries, including New Zealand, Costa Rica, and Norway, is already working together to develop rules to phase out fossil fuel subsidies through an agreement on climate change, trade, and sustainability. We also know that another set of countries is already undertaking on activities jointly in pursuit of a phase out of coal-fired power plants through the Powering Past Coal Alliance. But extending these models to fossil fuel production uh, is, is one of the questions that we're addressing here. But interestingly, here we see a recent proposal by US Vice Presidential uh, Candidate Kamala Harris we suggested that she was going to launch the first ever global negotiation of the cooperative managed decline of fossil fuel production. So knowing that, how would such international cooperation look like and how could it move forward? So here I'll try and sketch some of the key questions and issues that should be considered when developing some form of international coalition on fossil fuel production and climate change. So the first key question here I would say is the question of who can and who should participate. Universal participation might be preferred with, with all countries being on board, might be the desired end goal. But at the same time, it might make sense to start with a, with a club approach, with a group of front runners taking the lead. And if we take a club approach, such a club may then evolve into a larger coalition of countries and something that we're now seeing already with powering past coal, with more and more uh, coal, uh, important coal countries coming on board. The credibility of the club can certainly be strengthened by having uh, major fossil fuels uh, producers participate, but we should also keep in mind that the participation of other countries with little or no fossil fuel extraction, such as small island state and least developed countries, can also add moral weight to any initiative. Then a related question is whether we should also include uh, in the participation non-state and subnational actors. And here we can think of uh, subnational authorities participating as something beneficial for countries where subnational governments are taking action, but uh, federal governments are unwilling to do so. And ultimately, any of these, these types of, of initiatives could be modeled after a variety of cooperative initiatives with, that we already see in the, in the climate sphere and in, in recent years, particularly, especially after the Paris Agreement. We have initiatives such as the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, the Carbon, and Pri Carbon Pricing Leader, uh, Leadership Coalition, Powering Past Coal, which I already mentioned, where well, we have several research organizations, NGOs, subnational authorities, and businesses participating alongside governments. So the first question then is, is about participation, but then the next question is about which forum to use. And here we could think about trying to link any initiatives on fossil fuel production to existing forums, such as the UNFCCC, where we have already seen discussions on the just transition away from fossil fuels, assuming increasing importance in, in recent years. But we can also think about forums such as the G20, where we know that countries have pledged to face up to inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. But then it might also make sense to focus on creating a new forum dealing specifically with fossil fuel production and climate change. Of course, creating a new forum may entail some cost in terms of setting up a new administrative structure, but it would also avoid the political baggage that we know exists with, with, with some of the existing forums. However, I guess the most important point is even if a new forum is created, Cooperation on fossil fuel production does not need to be limited to just one form, and arguably, arguably you could even say that it should be pursued across a multiplicity of forms. 
So if countries want to pursue uh, commitments on fossil fuel production, so they can pursue general cooperation, but they can also try and come to concrete commitments to do something. Then the next question is what form such an, an agreement should have and what these commitments should be. And in terms of the form, some, some have suggested to have it as a presumably uh, legally binding treaty, but this is not the only possible form. International agreements, as, as any a lawyer on the call might know, can take a wide variety of forms, from non-binding political declarations, compacts, memoranda for understanding, to indeed a legally binding treaty. And while a legally binding treaty might signal a strong commitment on, on, on behalf of the participating countries, it would, as we probably all know, be very, very challenging to negotiate, and it would likely also preclude participation by non-state actors. Then the final question, uh, which is something that I would suggest that uh, also so some of the other panelists were, may, may reflect on, uh, is what should the contents of any such agreement be? So what kind of commitment should we be thinking of? Um, let me just highlight a few things to, to, to think about. Um, I think the first thing any agreement needs to think about is which fossil fuels it should cover. Should it be coal, oil and gas, or just maybe coal, or just like the Power and Plus Coal Coalition, or all of them? Um, how do we need to do, deal with, with uh, areas such as uh, coal mining, coal-fired power plants? Should we include both or just focus on, on, on mining, which would be the actual production of fossil fuels? And how should we deal with technologies like CCS? All of these questions would, would be, need to be, be answered in that process. Then as we come to the substantive commitments, we can think of a variety of types of commitments. We can think of a commitment to not build anything new, to not build, uh, build uh, no, uh, no new fossil fuel infrastructure. You can also think about phasing out existing infrastructure, which would obviously uh, uh, already go a step further. Or we could think of a more general obligation to uh, have a just transition away from fossil fuels. And in thinking about these types of commitments, we also need to think very carefully, and, and I'm sure uh, that, that uh, Navarro Stabas will, will, will reflect on this as well. We need to think very carefully about the position of developing countries, which so far are very much dependent on fossil fuel production. This is something already highlighted by, by Dr. Denton in, in the opening plenary as well. So what do we do with, with the countries who might have recently discovered fossil fuels in, in, their, in their territories? And then finally, I think it's important to think about, about the, the notion and the importance of transparency in any approach, in any type of international cooperation. Um, so we need to think about transparency of fossil fuel production plants, about the implications for climate change, and how that could figure into international cooperation. So I guess I've raised a lot of questions and I, and I think one hour is only so much time that we can, can have to answer some of these questions. But in my view, these are some of the main issues that we need to think about when we're thinking about concretely international cooperating on, uh, on fossil fuel production and climate policy. Thank you, Haro. Um, I just want to note for uh, those who are attending that there are some more links that are appearing in the chat to recent articles. Um, and, but we are asking that you post any questions to a separate Q&A link, uh, which you can find with the dot, dot, dot at the bottom of your screen. Uh, turning to Zipporah Berman, we've been hearing the term fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty a few times already in the last 15 minutes. That's something that you're working on. So can you tell us more about what such a treaty would include and who you would anticipate participating? Sure. Um, thank you, Catherine. And thank you to um, SEI for this really important forum. Um, so we've heard already this morning about the case for supply side policy, but the need uh, for uh, multilateral uh, cooperation and given the time frame, which I will, Catherine, start my stopwatch. Um, I, uh, um, I'm going to leap over that um, and uh, go through um, the, uh, what we're working on right now. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Great. Um, so we've already heard about the supply side challenge. There's an, there is quite a lot of momentum um, in this field. Um, this I, concept emerged from many academics almost simultaneously. We heard this morning from uh, Dr. Herr Asham. Uh, we are working uh, very closely uh, with uh, colleagues Peter Newell and Andrew Sims who have articulated the need for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty 
Um, and of course, uh, we saw in the past, historically, Pacific Island nations also called uh, for a global coal moratorium, civil society organized around the Lofoten uh, Declaration, and we're now seeing leaders like um, IOSA's Chair Ambassador Moses of Nauru and Camilla Harris calling for international cooperation. This year, Mary Robinson advocated uh, the treaty before the UN Security Council. Next slide, please. So um, the case is clear, but there are clearly, as we just discussed, systemic challenges. We, we've seen vested interests um, and capacity issues that make a phase out very challenging. So we aim to overcome these challenges through a unified call for global cooperation that will, among other things, set global obligations and norms, strengthen transparency and accountability on fossil fuel production and planned fossil fuel production, increase risks, costs, and uncertainty for investors, and embed principles of equity in the concept of just transition. This is a really uh, critical point. We saw already in the chat people saying, well, wait a minute, what about um, the markets? The markets are doing this. We're seeing capital flight, etc." That's true. We cannot let nation states off the hook at this moment in history. The fact is we are going to need global cooperation. There are many countries that can't negotiate a just transition on their own because in fact, they are currently so dependent economically uh, on production, or in fact, they're pursuing new production, such as uh, Ecuador, the new drilling in the Amazon, simply to feed their debt. We need a globally negotiated just transition. We need managed decline globally to reflect uh, principles of equity. Of course, you're all familiar with the tremendous work of Greg Mutit and Shivan Kartha on this point. Um, we believe a treaty will create the forum for those discussions. Next slide, please. So the, um, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty is framed in part um, using lessons from many treaties. Um, the pillars are designed after the Nuclear uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty, non-proliferation, global disarmament, peaceful transition. We now have work in each of those areas going on um, around the world. Um, the provisions of a treaty are for countries to negotiate, but the framework of non-proliferation kind of provides a guiding principles for a, a global regime. Next slide, please. So what we've been doing is building a broad international coalition and public civil society campaign, um, which will launch this year as partners around the world start to develop it, consisting of partner organizations from each region in the world, structured around diplomatic engagement, campaign, and research goals. Next slide, please. So in terms of diplomatic engagement, we aim to engage governments on the need for international cooperation and a pathway to achieve it in practice. The strategy has a number of parts uh, to start socializing the concept of a managed fossil fuel phase out and a just transition at the UN and other multilateral fora. Uh, the first piece, which we released last week, is the, the idea of a global registry of fossil fuels to promote government accountability and transparency on fossil fuel production. Next is a global commission um, modeled right now uh, a bit on the World Commission on Dams. So a global commission on fossil fuels to raise the profile of the issue and the treaty through high level engagement. And the final hurdle, of course, is to launch a formal process to deliver a negotiated legal instrument on the phase out of fossil fuels. We don't expect to see a universal treaty, at least in the medium term. Instead, we expect countries that are particularly vulnerable to climate change, non-producer countries, and over time, middle income and middle producer countries to join in the treaty effort to share in their challenge and diversify away from fossil fuels. Together, a coalition of such countries could have real power, both to support each other in their own phase out and transition plans, but also creating reputational and financial pressure. Next slide, please. I won't go into detail on the global registry given the time frame here, but I would suggest it would be interesting to this audience to take a look at the white paper that we've released as well as the RFP. Uh, our goal is to create uh, a prototype um, uh, to create uh, knowledge of what's happening around the world. It's absurd that civil society has had to add this up and, and, and we need to hold countries to account. Next slide, please. 
We have a comprehensive research program that's looking at a political economy analysis and stakeholder mapping of countries and regions to try to lump and split the countries and understand the barriers to this. Um, we also have uh, geopolitics and global political economy analysis, equity principles, transparency frameworks, and looking at other UN processes and multilateral frameworks. And then we have thematic and cross-cutting research under the other pillars, looking at narrative and communications, supply chain mapping, just transition, and a systems analysis. Next slide, please. And then finally, we're working with partners around the world to develop a global campaign with the goal of changing the narrative around fossil fuels, amplifying existing phase out efforts and highlighting a visual a vision of an equitable and just global transition. We're getting a lot of interest from youth groups around the world, some of whom have already launched their treaty campaigns in New Zealand. Fridays for the Future and youth groups have already launched their public campaigns. So in sum, we're taking a global systems approach to the fossil fuel industry with the idea of a treaty as a beacon to coalesce global civil society coalitions working in every region and, and increase pressure on industry and governments. I'll stop there. I know I'm six minutes, sorry about that. Quite all right. And I would just draw everyone's attention to links in the chat um, room to the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Organization's website and um, a page on that site on the Global Registry of Fossil Fuels. So, uh, Navroz Dubash, uh, do you think a major fossil fuel producing na nation like India, which is expecting tremendous growth in energy demand, would be willing to participate in such an international agreement? Um, and what lessons, as a keen observer of the UN FCCC process, um, do you think we might learn from, the, from that experience from the demand side for um, international cooperation on supply? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kathy, and, and thank you to SEI uh, for inviting me to join this, this panel and the other organizers. Um, so, so I was asked, uh, as Kathy uh, has, has, has framed the question, in part to, to reflect on all these ideas from the perspective of a large developing country, a fossil fuel uh, user, but I really feel I should start with a, with a, um, uh, with a sort of an exemption clause. I, uh, please don't consider me in any way, shape, or form channeling the government of India. I, not only would I not be capable of doing so, but, but, uh, uh, but uh, it, it's something that's well beyond my, my abilities. So I'm gonna actually speak from the perspective of a, of a watcher of the Indian debates, uh, but also trying to bring some of the ideas coming from Indian civil society and, and researchers. So um, I, I found this, like many climate debates, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, I, I thought uh, Professor Ashim's arguments were incredibly clear and the economic case for uh, something like a, uh, a supply side international uh, agreement are, 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 are very compelling. Uh, he also put forward an interesting point of view that for fossil fuel exporters, it might bring some of them on side because they may not suffer uh, the price drops that they otherwise would have. For, so those that they are able to sell, uh, they would be able to get a higher price for. The question really is, I think, to my mind about the politics. And I was very struck by Sephora's uh, really sort of thoughtful uh, uh, laying out of some of the issues and, and how they propose to, to, to meet them as well as Harrow's very sort of clear outline of an, of an agenda. Um, there are two things that really come up when you think about the politics around this proposal, right? So the first issue is if you do have some sort of treaty that limits how much you dig up and how much you burn, how do you allocate who digs up and burns uh, and on what, based on what principles. It's the old sort of climate equity question of, of, of allocation. It's something that I've written about, about with uh, Shivan Kartha uh, from SEI and others uh, coming out of, in fact, the first of these, of these uh, conferences. Uh, and the second big issue is the one that uh, I think both Haro and Sephora referred to, which is what does it mean for development prospects in particular of countries that, who, who expect their fossil fuel use to be growing? So let me just pick, uh, take, pick each of those up briefly. So on the allocation question, in a sense, we've been around this particular uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, lot a few times. Um, uh, the paper by Peter Newell and his colleagues uh, that is part of the non-proliferation um, uh, sort of initiative talk about, I think, the, the right kinds of principles, right? 
that if we have an allocation system to allocate uh, permits to extract and burn fossil fuels, it has to be rooted in UNFCC principles, such as con uh, common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities. It has to take into account historical uh, emissions. As Shivan and I and our colleagues put it in our paper, maybe we should be thinking about an extractor phase principle uh, commensurate with the polluter phase principle. All of this takes you down a, uh, a direction that would actually go a long way towards preserving the interests of developing countries and would be viewed sympathetically in India. As long as we get to burn some of our fuel as part of an adjustment, not in perpetuity, but as part of an adjustment, then sure, it makes sense uh, for, for a country like India to be on board. And if CBDR, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities at its core, then it's very much consistent with how India at least and many other countries think about this. The problem of course, is the politics of this. We were not able to get an allocation story going on the demand side, despite two efforts of, of uh, two decades of efforts uh, uh, trying to do so. And it's very unlikely that we will get uh, a political agreement around something like common but differentiated responsibility as the basis for allocation on the supply side, where the interests are actually much more con concentrated and therefore better able to mobilize uh, than on the demand side. So I see this as just a, a, an enormous problem, uh, really, to take this forward in the way of a, uh, in the form of a, of, a, of a sort of a formal treaty, which is where allocations are negotiated. Uh, I think the politics are just, are just too entrenched, excuse me. So what about the energy for development story? Now, a few years ago, uh, I actually remember people were projecting India's, uh, you know, that India would basically pull a China. Uh, when it came to something like coal use, right? That we were about to expand enormously. The standard storyline that has informed global politics has been that development, whether you understand that more in human development terms or in terms of GDP and economic development is very closely tied to energy and the cheapest forms of energy out there are fossil fuels. Now, of course, we're in a very, in a much more interesting world where fossil fuels are no longer for many uses uh, the cheapest uh, uh, or uh, uh, the, the cheapest sources and may not bring other benefits when it comes to the issues like air pollution and so on and so forth. Renewables uh, is now being added at a faster pace in most countries, uh, including, including India. So does that mean that this argument about energy for development has dissipated? Well, not exactly, right? Because the transition continues to be very fraught. Let me give you a couple of examples uh, from India. Uh, so, one of the challenges India faces in moving, say, its electricity sector to uh, renewables, a, a majority of renewables, is that in that transition process, what we are seeing is that industry currently cross-subsidizes household consumers and farmers, so they pay high prices. So they are likely to migrate off the grid to renewable energy, leaving the, the uh, uh, household consumers, poor people, farmers, essentially with the stranded assets of coal, right? So there's kind of a tussle going on right now of how do you manage this transition without actually placing all the costs on the poorest, right? So in that process, uh, so, so it's those kinds of local political economies uh, that uh, the solution to which may or may not be a slower phase out of coal. There are probably ways to do it without that, but at least it's part of the, people are, are unwilling to make that leap until they're sure this transition can happen in ways that are not socially disruptive, right? So it's a question of hedging your bets. And then the other disruption is the, is the standard one that we've seen in many countries, uh, which goes under the sort of broad label of the just transition story, which is what do you do with communities, uh, workers that are dependent on fossil fuels, and that's a story that's familiar to all of us. It's a tremendously important story. Of course, in a country like India, those communities tend to be even closer to the floor of subsistence levels. And so, and so are, are better, are less able to bear uh, those, those, sorts of, uh, those sorts of shocks. So all of these things uh, combine to lead a country like India, I would suspect, to a considerable amount of conservatism about taking, the, taking on the risk of these transitions. I found some of Sephora's ideas 
about a World Commission on Dams kind of structure, which incidentally I spent a couple of years studying the WCD. It's a really interesting process. Something that gets the conversation going, a registry that introduces transparency. These kinds of initial steps uh, might work, but I suspect many of the arguments I've put forward would also hold true, uh, including for, uh, for um, uh, fossil fuel exporters uh, like uh, Light South Africa. And I see some comments from uh, our friend and colleague, Harold Winkler, uh, on the chat. Let me, just, let me just say this. I think ultimately this conversation has to move very rapidly from what is feasible in terms of international politics to what is feasible in terms of domestic politics in key countries. What is the domestic narrative? If South Africa can build a domestic narrative that allows black economic empowerment, that creates jobs, that is consistent with the fossil fuel phase out, you have much greater hope of doing this. If India can create a domestic narrative similarly that talks about energy security, air pollution, uh, uh, as well as climate mitigation without disruptive change for uh, 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 farmers who are a big boat bank and for industry who of course bankrolls elections, then we have more of a, 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 a prospect of change. So I think we have to look at the domestic politics uh, in key countries. And that is, I think, a, 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 a part that I'm glad to see those of our colleagues working on this are, are thinking about actively. Um, but, but that's really where I would leave the conversation by shining the light really on where does domestic politics in key countries take us as part of this conversation. Thank you, Nevros. Um, we've got tons of fantastic questions coming in. Again, I'll just direct you to the, the Q&A option rather than the chat function for that purpose. Um, in order to cover more questions, I'll direct, um, I'll direct some of your questions to one of the panelists in each case. And um, we'll start with you, Gare. Um, why would fossil fuel producing countries agree to things in a new treaty that they haven't agreed to under the existing Paris Agreement and UNFCCC? That is because uh, with, uh, uh, supplies, with supplies of policies, fossil fuel prices will be higher. Um, but um, so, so like um, uh, there was also a question of why, why would countries like uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar uh, go along with uh, uh, supply side uh, policies. Um, that's actually quite easy to answer um, because it would be in their advantage, especially if one allocates the reductions in fossil fuel produ production or um, in, in a cost efficient way. Because it's clear that uh, it's not so Saudi Arabia which should, should not produce the oil, it is uh, especially coal that should be not produced and, and, and developed uh, further. And uh, the, the, the oil of uh, Saudi Arabia is, uh, is valuable. The, the coal that might be um, developed is not, uh, is not valuable. So, um, but that in order to, to avoid that uh, countries like uh, um, South Africa and uh, India expand their coal production, then perhaps one would, would hope that uh, these uh, Fossil, um, these oil producing countries could compensate uh, uh, um, countries like South Africa and India for not producing their coal. How this can be done politically is not, uh, is, 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 is difficult. Um, countries like Norway, Canada and, and Australia should be able to limit their, 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 uh, their production of coal or fossil fuel production, uh, uh, their limit their fossil fuel production without any, any compensation. Of course, countries like, uh, like I mentioned, India and, and, uh, and, uh, and South Africa should be, there's an argument that they should be compensated for not using the. Thank you. Haro, um, another question that's getting lots of, lots of votes in the Q&A is, irrespective of what the optimal architecture for such a treaty might look like, there's a wider question about whether the UN FCCC will ever be ready and able to explicitly integrate um, constraining fossil fuel production into its political and legal regime. So do you feel there's space in the UN FCCC for such a discussion? Right. Thanks, Cathy, and uh, thanks also for I think Leo uh, for asking that question. Um, it's a very uh, very pertinent one. 
And I think uh, for those of us who have been following UNFCCC uh, negotiations for a long time, uh, we get a bit skeptical and pessimistic about its ability to deal with very uh, challenging and, and pressing issues like this. Um, is there space to, to develop um, any commitment for countries to, to phase out fossil fuel production? I would probably say no, um, but that is also a very ambitious goal. And that would be an ambitious goal either within the UNFCCC or outside of it. Um, is there space for countries to raise this on the agenda? And I think that's where the answer is, is certainly yes. Um, because I think the UNFCCC, as, as, as uh, again, insiders will know, it's a party driven process. Um, and that means that parties can bring these issues to the table uh, at, 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 at relevant forms within the UNFCCC. But I think after Paris, it's even become more party driven in the sense that parties can determine what they want to do themselves in terms of their mitigation goals. So in a paper that I think was already included in the link, um, my, my SEI colleagues and I, we've looked at some of the options where parties can actually push these issues forward, and that is including uh, fossil fuel supply me uh, like limitation measures uh, in their NDCs. It's raising these issues in the long-term 2050 strategy. Um, it's by trying to bring this to the attention of the global stock take, for example, by linking the production gap uh, results to the global stock take in 2023. Um, it's linking climate finance discussions under Article 21C, so that's the, the long-term goal to, to uh, make sure that that's climate finance is ultimately climate friendly. Um, to also raise issues of, of fossil fuel finance in that discussion. Um, I will certainly not say that this is going to be easy, but I would say that there is uh, plenty of opportunity in, in different forms under the UNFCCC for parties that wish to raise this to do so. Thank you. Um, Sapora. Do you see a risk that efforts to create a new agreement on the supply side could take off the pressure, um, shift the focus away from negotiations on emissions mitigation targets? Hmm. It, it's a good question, um, but I think it's quite the opposite. Um, social change isn't linear. Uh, we know that. Um, when you see uh, civil society pressure or um, raising of particular issues, decision makers respond. They don't necessarily respond to that particular issue. Let me give you a concrete example. Campaigns across Canada and across North America against pipelines for many years and against tar sands expansion um, led in part um, to the Pan-Canadian Climate Framework, which is a framework that didn't address tar sands expansion and didn't address pipelines. Um, but what it did address is demand side measures because that was the policy framework that the government had um, for, for addressing climate change. When our prime minister in Canada announced that agreement, explicitly said this is in part because of the controversy um, and unrest across the country about the future of energy and pipelines. So, so they were hearing the controversy, they were knowing they had to do something to increase climate ambition that led to a nationwide carbon tax, et cetera. So there, we believe that an increased debate of something this bold, um, this audacious, this high, you know, changing the bar um, on climate leadership that coalesces what civil society and frontline communities have been saying for years. There already is a keep it in the ground movement around the world, but we're fighting project by project. And so if you unite that and start to have millions of citizens, cities endorsing the concept of the treaty, like you had with nuclear nonproliferation, where you're starting to have an increased and, and coalesced drumbeat and demand uh, for governments to stop expansion around the idea of a treaty, does that increase ambition and force governments to have to show they're acting on climate change because they don't want the conversation around a treaty that constrains expansion. We think it will. Thank you, Sapora. Um, Nevroz, you also, you've already raised the question of the domestic politics. Um, and there's a question posed that the key politics that matters is not international, it's national. Domestic political elites in many countries rely on large rents from fossil fuel production. How will these be replaced? And if they can't, um, isn't there a concern that those elites will oppose serious action, even if 
they support the theory in international fora. And I'm going to throw in my own question here, and that's whether the domestic politics could be different in fossil fuel exporting nations rather than those that are primarily producing for their own consumption. Right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Um, no, that's. I think it's a. It's a really good. Uh, it's a really good question. I'll. I'll come back to your. Your add-on uh, to the question. Um, but I think the. I think what. You know, as, as uh, one. Th one thing Sephora said in her uh, remarks stuck. Stuck with me, which is that there is kind of a point of view that says, look, this is happening anyway. We're seeing the technology uh, transition. Uh, we're seeing industries. Uh, uh, making bets that are basically uh, not bets in favor of fossil fuels. And certainly uh, in India, you see some of these dynamics. I was in a, in a, on a uh, public event with the former head of Coal India Limited, the largest coal uh, mining company in the world. And he basically said, there will be no new power plants built in India. Nobody will bet on that. Which doesn't mean that we're going to stop burning coal, of course, because we have a big stock of, of power plants. And so people are beginning to see those, those, those changes. And, and I think that, um, uh, so, so many of the interests that would otherwise have fought tooth and nail for this are beginning to kind of swing uh, um, uh, to a point of view that says, this is not something uh, that our long-term interests are tied to. These, these technologies and these fuels are not where our long-term interests are. Uh, but as I argued, they nonetheless, at the government level, and at the level of um, uh, you know, how they would position themselves would nonetheless argue for the option, right? So, so now coming back, I think that the core idea here is less the treaty and more the conversation of a treaty about fossil fuel non-proliferation. It's about injecting that as a serious option uh, in a way that the keep it in the ground campaign and the numbers that came out of that sort of seminal paper and the effects on the underlying stock prices of fossil fuel companies change the conversation. So to the extent that we think about this as a conversation changing dynamic that can then feed into domestic politics from the outside, then I think it's productive. I think sort of having, so, so moving towards the treaty in itself is productive, trying to leap to a treaty and saying, well, in three years, we need to have this thing in place, will just actually stiffen the backbone of the interests and, and, and arouse a sort of backlash and get those people who are beginning to come around to rethinking their interests to actually bring down the filter and, and, and stop thinking openly about this transition. So I think, I think if we're talking about this as a process and an opening of a conversation politically, I think that's productive. Uh, if, if, we, if, we, if we, with due respect to Harrow, if we bring the lawyers into the game too early and make this about a negotiation that we, we might be losing the point. Thank you, Nevros. Um, over to you, Haro. There's a question about bottom-up approaches, um, the role of bottom-up fossil-free zones, including um, coal-free uh, sub-national jurisdictions, coal-free states, fracking-free municipalities, um, building towards fossil free countries. Um, so what do you see as, as the role of these bottom up processes in a stepping, as stepping stones towards a fossil free non-proliferation treaty? Well, I see them as, as quite an important role. And I think um, uh, Tsipora also mentioned the idea of clubs. I mentioned it myself. And I think if we think more freely about who can participate in the club, uh, things can get much more exciting because I think uh, several people have been talking about the importance of domestic politics uh, in, in actually uh, creating this shift. Um, if we just focus on intergovernmental cooperation, we probably know where, and, 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 and uh, inter intergovernmental negotiations, we probably know where it will end. Um, but if we start bringing in additional players from subnational authorities, from progressive companies, from um, NGOs that, are there, that have uh, not just environmental NGOs, but also maybe in public health and other areas that might be interested in moving away from fossil fuels, um, things I think can get a lot more promising and new coalitions could be built that we might not have seen before. Um, I think the idea of fossil free, uh, fossil free zones um, is, is a particularly interesting one because it's quite broad. Um, because it's like so I think if uh, I think several people have been suggesting to focus specifically on, on coal and um, that's maybe a very very justified thing to do 
Um, but the idea of fossil free, uh, fossil free zones is very important, which also means that you can get a lot of different actors on board. And that I think could move things forward. The one risk you might get with that is that it's so broad that no one really feels that they need to commit on certain things that's, that matter in terms of production. Um, and I think this is one of the things that's, uh, that that's, is, uh, has been shown with, with Powering Past Coal, uh, where you could say, well, Powering Past Coal is great, but actually it doesn't focus on coal mining. It focuses on coal-fired power plants. So what about those countries? And I think this is also raised in the chat already, those countries with, that are major coal producers, such as Australia, um, um, where are they in, in, in this type of coalition? Um, so I think it can be potentially promising, and I think uh, building on uh, trying to build these these clubs with broad participation, and also trying to think creatively about who could participate, is uh, at this moment I would say a key step. Thanks, Haro. Uh, Sapora. Uh, We've seen a proliferation of climate litigation around the world with many of those cases focusing on uh, new fossil fuel production projects. And you've already touched on campaigns against pipelines, which I think are closely related. Do you think, what role do you think that litigation can play in this transition towards limiting fossil fuel supply and towards uh, a non-proliferation treaty? Well, I, I think litigation is is absolutely critical because it even the process and the the threat of potential outcomes um, in litigation is already having an impact um, in markets and on government policy. Um, it in and in some cases, of course, as we've seen with the um, uh, our, our Children's Trust and other cases, um, it's changing the debate um, on on what is climate leadership and forcing a much more public debate about within countries and uh, internationally on what is acceptable uh, targets, etc. So, um, you know, and um, we have a capacity and a time frame problem because uh, these uh, cases are expensive. Um, they're time consuming. Um, and the strategy of industry in many of these cases has been to make sure that they go on as long as they can um, uh, to wait it out, um, which of course increases costs, et cetera. Many of the cases are being brought forward by coalitions of civil society groups, nonprofits, um, et cetera. And, and, and that can um, shrink the budgets of those nonprofits and philanthropic foundations from uh, other initiatives. So it's very dangerous to, re to rely simply uh, on uh, the legal cases, and, and but I think um, they uh, are uh, absolutely essential. Um, but you know I, what I think we can't forget here, and we and and we often do in these conversations because the debates and the processes and the which proposal is important are so interesting and critical um, is the time frame that we have. So I've had um, uh, it, it, people say, you know, meeting with nation states around the idea of the treaty, you know, well that, uh, you know, that's that's really big. That's really, you know, that's that's really new. You know, you know, you know, we're overwhelmed by the um, idea. This is a moment in history when we need big. We need new because what we've been doing hasn't been working. We need audacious. Um, and we have to remember the time frame we're dealing with. The incredible work of Stockholm Environment Institute and others has shown us through the production gap report that we're on track to produce 120% more fossil fuels than the world can safely burn. And we heard this morning from IISD and others that the majority of the stimulus money is in fact going to fossil fuels and fossil fuel development. Our intellectual and financial capital continues to be shoveled into uh, producing a, produ a product that threatens the world's security that we can't even burn. And we can't forget that. And I, and I just, you know, I, I live in the Pacific Northwest. We can't go outside today because of the smoke. The fires are raging all across uh, the Western uh, North America. And so we have to remember that we're racing against the clock. And so I think we need legal challenges. We also need bold new proposals. We need it all because we're running out of time. Thank you, Sapora. Yes, I'm also looking at the just apocalyptic looking skies outside the window here. Um, I think we just have time for one more question. I'm going to pose it to Gare. 
Um, there hasn't been much talk about the role of extractive companies. We've been talking about governments. BP's new strategy aims at net zero by 2040. Uh, do you see a positive role for oil, gas, and coal mining countries, both the multinationals and state-owned enterprises? And if so, what might that role look like? Yeah, I believe that, that uh, the role of companies are related to the role of, uh, of governments in this in this, this uh, in, in this, uh, uh, when it comes to, to, to this development, if uh, governments try to, to uh, um, do not uh, allow for more development, also the, the companies will have to, will have to uh, turn elsewhere for their development. So, um, um, so but I, I don't really have any uh, strong views on this. I, I would just want to say as my, my concluding remarks that uh, um, we've, we've tried um, so, uh, demand side policies and it has been a failure. Failure. We have to try everything in order to do something with climate change. And uh, um, there are strong arguments for, for uh, supply side uh, policies. We, we should not go for a grand treaty. We should rather go for some kind of Paris process, process on, the, on the supply side. Uh, maybe that that uh, start with uh, rich, uh, well-organized fossil fuel producing countries with climate goals that they try to limit their own, especially exploration for, for fossil fuels. And then maybe also um, um, uh, uh, challenge other fuel, uh, fuel producing countries to, to, um, um, for, to state nationally determined contributions uh, for the de um, development and production of fossil fuels, and that it's, it's important for 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 the for the for countries to start a process like that, and 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 uh, back to the companies. Then companies will also have stronger incentives to turn around and uh, use their um, the, 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 their invest in other things than try to de develop more fossil fuels. Thank you. We are, we're drawing to the end of our time and I wanna give uh, a little bit of time at the end to our organizers to highlight next steps. So um, let me just conclude by thanking all of the panelists and thanking the participants who posed such great questions. As Sapor Berman indicated, um, we need, the time is very short and we need new and audacious ideas. And I think these panelists are, contributing that they're concretely moving forward with both research and um, and organizing to to advance the conversation we know that the this exclusive focus on the demand side hasn't served us well um, and the one thought that I would leave this conversation with is the importance of uh, the justice lens that has come through in many of of the remarks that if we are bringing fossil fuel producing countries on board because this will have greater economic benefit to them, there's the risk that we will be enhancing the already greater wealth of, of those countries. So building in the conversation about the kinds of subsidies, um, cross subsidies that Gare was talking about from oil producing states to the coal producing states in the first instance. Um, so again, thank you to all the panelists. And with that, I'm going to hand things back to Georgia um, on next steps for the fossil fuel supply conferences. Thanks, Kathy, and thanks to all the panelists. That was a really terrific discussion. I'm really pleased that we were able to have this. Um, there were a lot of great questions raised today that we didn't have the time or space to cover. Questions about, you know, how we deal with national politics, local politics, uh, questions about the interaction between supply side policies and demand side policies. What I'll say is please take that energy, take these questions and start thinking about presentations and panels that you might want to organize at the conference that we're going to be holding next year in Oxford and online. Um, we'll open the call for papers in February. If you want to get a notification when that happens, please sign up at the link on the bottom of the screen here, which I hope will also appear in the chat box while I'm speaking. Uh, we'd love to have you all there and we'd love to continue these discussions and expand these discussions into a whole range of other interesting areas. So thank you to everybody for participating today and I really appreciate 
everybody 